seated. What timing. The sirens go off as we begin our message this morning. And since there is no such thing as just coincidences, maybe that is a good thing just to start with. The Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at is, is it should come with a siren. Just to get our attention. That's what sirens do, don't they? They get our attention. They tell us, hey, hey wake up from your normal, everyday going about, doing whatever you're doing, and pay attention. That's what the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes are for, those eight Beatitudes. Um, they're, they're to tell us that something different than the norm is going on. They're counterintuitive. They don't match up to our normal way of thinking and being in the world. Because they are God's way, and the scripture tells us God's way much different than the world's way. There was a young fellow who moved into a new city, and he noticed that everybody looked pretty good. They were, they were suited up, and uh, everybody was, had tailor-made uh, vestments, and they were just really, really good looking. And he asked the fellow, where do I uh, go to get such a, a suit? They all look like they've been tailor-made for you. And he said, ah, they have been. You go to a fellow down the street, turn left, you see a shop, his name is Giuseppe. He is the best tailor in the world, that's why we look so fine. If you're going to be a resident of this community, you really need to have one of his handmade tailored suits just for you. So the young man thought, well, I certainly want to be a part of the community and I want to look nice like everybody else. So he went to Giuseppe's shop and he said, I need a suit. And Giuseppe looked him up, looked him down, said, okay, come back in a week. He said, don't you have to measure? He said, ah, oh, no, Giuseppe knows these things. Go, come back in a week. So he went. He came back in a week. Giuseppe gave him the clothes. He said, go in the back room, put them on. He put them on. He came out. He noticed that the one pant leg was longer than the other. He said, this pant leg is longer than the other. Giuseppe said, that's not a problem. He said, just put your hand in your pocket and pull it up until it matches the other one. He said, oh, okay. He, but then he noticed that the one arm on his coat was longer than the other one. Giuseppe said, well, you just, you just have to maneuver. Your, there you go. So if you keep your hand in and pull these pants up and this one down, he said, well, you know, my collar, this side over here is, is sticking up. And he said, well, just put your chin down there on it. There you go. Now you're all set. So the young man, he, he walks out of the, the store like that. And a couple of old guys playing checkers on the side looked at him and said, oh, we must pray for that young man. Look at how contorted he is. Look how... How, how bent over and, 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 and how, how, how mangled his body is. And the other guy said, yes, but what a nice suit. <laughs> we live in a world where we will do all sorts of things in order to have the nice suit look. We will contort our own beliefs and our, our own sense of what is good and what is right, we will adjust ourselves in order to make sure that the world has a certain appreciation of us. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Look in your bulletin and there you will see the scripture. Let's catch ourselves up because each one is worth looking at individually, but we have to see their interconnectedness because they don't stand apart, but rather stand in the whole. And Matthew 5, 1 through 5, it says, After seeing the crowds coming after him, Jesus was not at all interested in having a bunch of fame. He's got a lot of fans today. The question is how many followers? He sees the crowds, and they're coming after him because they can get something from him. They, they, they've seen miraculous feedings. So if they were hungry, there was fish and bread. Nothing wrong with that. They saw miraculous healings where if they had some type of infirmity, they could come and he would heal them. Nothing wrong with that. But the crowds were coming after Jesus because they could get something 
from him. Jesus has a lot of fans. Here, he is concerned with disciples. So he goes up a mountain. Remember, that is supposed to sort of put a uh, aha, like Moses. One like Moses. Moses is the one that goes up the mountain. So we have one like Moses who goes up the mountain. And when he finds a quiet place, he sits down. Remember, that is, that is their, their indication. You better pay attention because the teacher sits down when he is going to say something important. This is his writing on the chalkboard. This is, you better take notes. There will be a test on this. So he sits down, his disciples, his climbing companions come to him. Now remember, he's teaching the disciples the Sermon on the Mount, these Beatitudes, not the crowds, not the fans, but the followers, the disciples, those who have a interest in something greater and deeper. His disciples come to him, he opens up his mouth and he taught them. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember that blessed are, are those who are desperate. That's what this is saying. Who understand that they have no merit on their own. Now this isn't something that you sign up for. and This isn't something that you, 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 you practice and practice until you get He's saying, no, this is reality. That there isn't one who isn't poor in spirit. If you think you are, you're really delusional. You are poor in spirit. You have no merit. You have no standing before the Lord God. It doesn't matter what you've done. You've always done and never balances. It never balances. One breaking of the law, one sinful act, and you're outside the realm of the holy. And God cannot be where sin is. And so you have no claims. This is what it's saying. To be poor in spirit is a realization that God gives you, that the Spirit gives you, that says you don't stand in front of God on any, on any merit of your own. The only way you can stand in front of God is if a friend gets you there. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. These all flow together. We have three rungs now of a ladder, but a ladder isn't a ladder that descends or ascends. It's more of a, a, a movement inward, the deeper we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We realize we don't have any merit. We have no claim to fame. We have nothing in and of ourselves. And that makes us mournful when we understand that we hurt the heart of God. We do. Not anybody else. We're always good at pointing out everybody else, aren't we? Those other people, those big sinners, those ones who... You know, don't put me in the same category as those other people. Well, yeah, we are. There's only one category. And we're in that category, human. And we are mournful. When we understand that we are broken. We aren't what we're supposed to be. That we have no means of approaching God. And that mournfulness that what we do our, our attitude, our insight, our feelings, our basic motivations, what we, we do to go to get a suit to fit in with others is all about our brokenness. And we are mournful that that hurts the heart of God. Then that takes us to the next. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. They shall inherit the earth. This is sort of like saying they will get it all. When you inherit the land, that is the big promise that God has given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of the people of the Bible. To inherit the land means you get the whole kit and caboodle. This is the big one, okay? When you inherit the earth, the land, so blessed are the meek. Well, that's very counterintuitive, isn't it? No one here wants to be meek. When we think of meek in our own definition, we think of somebody who's uh, milk toast, 
Huh? We think of somebody who is doormat. We think of somebody who doesn't have backbone. We think of somebody who is just not a, a hero, right? Well, that's because we think of meek in our own worldly terms. Webster's Dictionary has uh, uh, three definitions. One definition of a meek person is one who is not violent or strong. Another is a person who is deficient in spirit and courage. The other definition, which is the closest to the biblical definition, is enduring injury with patience and without resentment. Hmm, quite a bit different, isn't it? When we're looking to see what meek is all about, we, we can't let human, we can't let worldly define it. We need to look at Scripture, how does Scripture define it. Numbers 12.9 says that Moses was the meekest of all men. Now, we don't think of Moses normally as meek, do we? He certainly wasn't meek. He went in front of Pharaoh. He said, let my people go, saith the Lord. He, 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 he murdered an Egyptian. He was one who led all these people out into the desert across the Red Sea. We really don't see him as meek. Yet it says he was the meekest of all men. We don't see Abraham as one who is meek. The father of all nations. We don't see him as really being a meek person. He was a person who stood up. He was a person who with Lot went out into the wilderness. He was a person who followed as God led. He was a, a strong person, a person of character. We really don't see that as meek. And Jesus, I hope we don't see, though if you remember that childhood verse, Jesus meek and mild, not meek in the sense that we normally think of meek, but meek in a different sense. Biblical meekness, as in all things of the Bible, aren't about us and others, first and foremost. It's not about us and the world. It's always about God. Those who are meek are meek towards God. What does it mean to be meek towards God? It means that we go with what God is about and thinks about, first and foremost. We don't go and get the new suit and hobble around all contorted and disfigured to look good in the eyes of men. We're more concerned with What's on God's mind? What about God? When, how meek are you? That's a question I have to ask myself. Larry, how meek are you? The answer is, when was the last time you sought God's direction for the breath you just took? Not on the big questions, on all questions. Meekness has to do with reliance upon God Almighty in all things. Not just in the big things and not just in the little things, but in all things. Jesus continually went out and was in prayer to the Father, discerning God's will. Meekness is the prayer in Gethsemane. Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. Meekness is concerned with God's will. Always, always. Now, most of us, we, we, we like God. We like to inform him and advise him and, you know, consult him and let him know what we think he should bless and how he should operate the world and the universe. That's not meekness. That's the opposite of meekness. When we tell God how things ought to be, that's not meekness. That's inside out and upside down. And yet, we probably find we do that a lot, don't we? Instead of going to God and, 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 and asking God in every moment of our living in life, what, Lord, would you have me do? Quite often, we do things and then ask God to bless them. 
don't we? Instead of seeking God first and his will, we don't operate that way. We do say that God gave us a mind, a brain, we're supposed to use it. Yes, but that doesn't mean independently and separate from God. That means using that mind and that brain to seek that which is only worth seeking, God and God's will. It is counterintuitive for us to approach the Beatitudes and think, well, that may be okay for the Bible, but a person in today's age couldn't live that way. See, that's the opposite of meek thinking and living. To be meek means that the God of yesterday, today, tomorrow is the same and he is able. To be meek means to understand God is able. I'm not able, you're not able, but God is able. And do we rely upon our God? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. That is the promise that is given to us humans. God created us out of the dirt. Okay? That's, he created us in, and blew into us the breath of life, making us a living soul. And he promises us the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When we follow the ways of God, when we are looking towards God, we are firmly grounded in what we're supposed to be about. I love the instructions that Teresa of Calcutta had given us. This sums up, I think, meekness. She says, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them, anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of having ulterior motives. Be kind, anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten, will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good today anyway. Give the world the best you have and it will never be enough, but give the best you have anyway. For you see in the end, it's only between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. When we find that our lives are directed by, motivated by going to Giuseppe the tailor in order to be acceptable, to look like, to be normal, then we are in fact saying to our God, we don't need you. We don't want you. Blessed are the meek, the meek towards God, those who look to God for all things. May we be meek 